How y'all doing? Good, fine, okay, mediocre, tired, all the above. Well, good. Well, before we do this, let's pray. Um, Father, I thank you so much, God, for the way that sometimes things line up even when we don't plan it, um, even when we don't necessarily orchestrate things to work out the way they do. But Lord, talking about your expression of love um, being the cross, something that we would never expect, Lord. And then we sing a song about your love running red and our sins being washed white because of the cross. Lord, I'm, I am in awe of you, Lord. So I thank you for, for doing things far better than I ever could, for just making things better than I could ever orchestrate them. Lord, I thank you so much for that. Lord, I pray that this time that we gather around your word, that we open your word and we look at it, God, I pray that our hearts would be, would be focused on you, that we would really know you and experience you through your word today. God, I pray that you would move us, that you would help us to live um, the way you've called us to live. God, I pray that you would prod us in the right direction, that you would move us so that we would follow you more closely and we would just know you more and experience your grace and your presence in our lives on a day-to-day -day basis. Lord, I pray... No, not even just a day-to-day -day basis, Lord, a moment-by-moment -moment basis. God, I pray that our lives would be constantly ingrained with your grace, that we would just walk out of that expression of your love, out of this promised son, out of this son that you sent for us to die and to take our place on that, on that cross that we now see as an expression of your love. So, Father, I pray that that would be our motivation, that that would be our joy, that that would be everything, God. Um, and I ask that in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, all right. Um, because I, I believe most of y'all are probably, if you, even if I haven't dismissed our kids to Children's Church. Oh, man, I'm a failure. If our kids want to go to Children's Church, they are welcome to go. Um, yeah, I'm dropping the ball on that one. Um, but they are welcome to go if they would like. So, um, because I know y'all lost an hour of sleep we are going to do something to hopefully engage your minds just a little bit, okay? I promise this isn't going to be too strenuous, but I don't want anybody to blurt this out. But if you know the answer to this little quiz, I just want you to raise your hand, okay? So a quick quiz, and I want to see if you can guess the poem that I have in my mind. How many of you think you know what it is right now before I've said anything about it? You think you do? Okay, did I put, some, did I put a slide in? I didn't think so. Okay. So Steve thinks he knows what it is. Well, we're going to see if Steve's right. Um, so you can tell James if you want to, but keep it quiet because I don't want anybody else to guess. Um, and I think I've actually used the same poem because it's like one of three that I really know. Uh, <laughs> so I think I've used this one as the sermon introduction before, but we're going to try it again today. So I'm going to give you clues as to what this is. Anybody like poetry? Are there any poets in the room? Okay, so a few of you. I am not one of those, so just make that clear. Poetry is not my forte, but I would like this quiz. I'm going to give you clues, and if you think you know what it is, don't blurt it out. Just raise your hand and keep that hand raised, and we're going to see how many people will think they know what it is before I actually tell you what it is, okay? So first, I'm going to give you the author, and this one might be a dead giveaway, but I'm going to try it anyway. This, this poem is by a guy named Robert Frost. Anybody think you know what it is now? If you think you know what it is, raise your hand. Okay, so a few of you think you know what it is. All right, we'll go one step further. Now, this is a very famous poem, so I want to see if we can get this. I'm going to give you the first line. The first line, and see how many of you know it then. The first line is, two roads diverged in a yellow wood. Anybody know what it is now? A few more hands. A few more, but not many still. That's good. I don't feel so bad. Thank you all for making me feel better. I know, like, one poem, so I'm cooking here. All right. Well, anybody who knows what it is? Do you know what it is? The Road Not Taken. The Road Not Taken by Robert Frost. Everybody knew what it was, but the title was kind of hard to guess. But that's one of just a few poems I know. One of a few poems I know. And the reason I bring that up is because the whole premise of this poem is the author is standing here at a fork in the road. So he's walking down this trail and there is a fork in the road and he stands there for a minute. And he stops and he says, which way should I go? And he's examining these two paths and trying to determine which, which path should I take today? 
which one should I go down? And he looks down one and it's well worn. It looks like it's been taken by a lot of people. And he says, well, I could go that way. Or there's this other road, which it, it says that it, it was wanting wear. In other words, it, it's not traveled very often. This is the less taken of the two paths. Which one should I take? Because I'm sure, he says, I'm sure both of them will have their own adventures. I'm sure both of them will have their own unique aspects. But which one should I take? And the reason I bring this up is because what, what the Christian faith offers is a fork in the road. What Jesus offered, what the cross offers, is a fork in the road. Your life is going forward, and the cross is right there. And at that point, when you come to the cross, you have a decision to make. Am I going to take this well-worn path this direction? Am I going to go this way, where I can see clear down here, I can see all the way down the road? I can see a long ways. Everybody's taking this road. It is well-worn and well-beaten. Or there's this other path. This may be a little more mysterious, it's a little harder to see, but it looks like it, it's less traveled also. But that could be interesting too. Which road should you take? And obviously, you know what I'm going to say. I mean, I would be a really bad preacher if I said, take this path over here. That would be a bad idea. No. Okay, look, I'll just give you the cheat sheet. Take the road less traveled. And that's what, that's what Robert Frost in this poem ultimately decides. He says, I took the road less traveled. And he said, I know that I'll probably never get a chance to take the other road, but I'm going to take the road less traveled. So that's what we're going to see in today's text. In today's text, if you have a Bible, I invite you to open it with me. We're going to be in Genesis 18 and 19. It's a long section. And for that reason, I'm not going to read it all this morning because I don't have time. Um, so I would encourage you. I would encourage you, if you really want to dive in deeper, go and read the second half of Genesis 18 and Genesis 19. Many of you are familiar with this passage anyway. It's, it's all about Sodom and Gomorrah. Anybody ever heard of those places? Okay, you're probably not going to find them on a map now, but we'll explain that later. So, but what we have is these two divergent paths. We're going to see these two paths that different characters take. We see Abraham on one side and we see Lot on the other. And I really wanted to name this The Tale of Two Paths, but I've never read the book A Tale of Two Cities and I have no idea what it's about. So um, it sounded good though, like, hey, Tale of Two Cities. No, I don't know what that's about. Can't do that. So anyway, somebody could educate me later and I would appreciate that. But I want to do this just a little bit different today because I, well, I'll just confess, I messed up last week and I should have continued on in chapter 18 and I shouldn't have stopped where I did because I think it would have tied nicely. But we're going to tie it in today. So we're going to do it a little bit different. My goal today is to walk through the entire text just bit by bit, and we'll, I'll, I'll do my best to explain what's going on and some significant features, and I'll read selected lines um, just so that we can kind of get a lay of the land. And at the end, at the very end, we're going to come back, and that's when we'll have our, our points. And I'll try my best to apply. I want to show you three lessons that we can pull from this text and directly apply to our lives. That's, that's my goal today is to show you the text, then apply it later. So if you're looking for a line by line, like, okay, let's, let's say, okay, here's point one, spell out how it, it's not going to happen. I'm sorry. I just, that's not the way it's going to work today. So it's going to be a little bit different. But my goal is to get to these three lessons at the end, and we'll move pretty quick through this text. So first thing we need to do, though, is to think back to last week, because this does tie right into last week. Remember, this is all one grand narrative, okay? So we're still rolling with this, with this, this narrative on Lot's, or Abraham's life. And last week, we saw that there were these three visitors who came to see Abraham, these three visitors show up and Abraham is reclining at the entrance of his tent in the heat of the day and Abraham rushes out to serve him. We find out later that one of these is identified as the Lord and we get indications that these other two are angels, right? So these, these angels show up and they meet with Abraham. But midway through chapter 18, these angels, they turn their attention towards Sodom, they turned their attention towards Sodom. And previously, their attention had been on Abraham and his life and Sarah and how they, how they will carry out the promise of God. How they will actually be the family that God uses to bless all the nations. Okay, That was the attention before, but it shifts to Sodom. And at the beginning of our text today, we're going to see that there is this internal discussion that seems to be going on with, with God himself or between God and the angels. We don't know, but there's this internal discussion that Abraham seemingly is not privy to. So we get this, this story, and it's all about what Abraham, it, whether or not they should tell Abraham what God is about to do. 
Should we let Abraham know? Should we not tell him? Should we keep it a secret? What should we do? And there's a key line, a key line in chapter 18, verse 19. Verse 19, it says, I have chosen him. I have chosen him so that he will command his children and his house after him to keep the way of the Lord by doing what is right and just. So here, there's this internal discussion about should we tell him, should we not tell him? And then he says, but wait, I've chosen him. I've chosen him so that he could teach his children and his grandchildren and his house after him to walk in the way of the Lord. So that's, it's a rhetorical, yes, we should tell him for this reason, because I have chosen him, God says. And this word chosen is an interesting one. If you read out of the King James, it probably says, because I knew him. Um, Some translations say, because I have singled him out. Most contemporary translations, however, say, because I have chosen him. And the word here is, it's the Hebrew word yada. Um, it actually, in the form it's used here, it's yadati, but it's the word yada. Okay, and whenever I think about this, it's like, yeah, I know that yada, yada, yada. We know what's going on. That's how I remember this. So that's the Hebrew word yada. And what it means is to know. So a literal translation would be, I know him. But there's a deeper connotation to this word that's important that we, we recognize this word. Not only does it mean some mental assent like, I know him, because God knows everybody, Right? God knows everything. He's all-knowing. So, of course, he knows everybody. So to say, I know Abraham, is nothing uncommon. He could say, I know Lois. I know Parker. He could go around the room and say, I know every one of you. I know because God knows everything, right? So why does it specifically say, I knew him or I yada him? Why does it say that? Well, this word carries the idea of, of discriminating or setting apart. Like It's like saying, okay, yeah, I know him. I have discriminated him. I can distinguish between Abraham and everybody else. I have distinguished him. I have discriminated him apart from everybody else. And that's why many contemporary translations say, I chose him. And for this reason, for this reason, because God has set him apart, he says, I'm going to let him in on what I'm going to do. Because I know him because I've chosen him. But why does that have anything to do with this? Like, okay, I've chosen him, but why does that mean I should tell him what's going to happen? Well, he says, I have chosen him so that. And I love love that, okay? We're working. (laughs) Our small groups have just started meeting. One of the things that we're talking about is marking up a Bible. We're talking about marking up a Bible. I'll just tell you, whenever I mark up my Bible, every time I come across the word so that, I put a box around it. Every single time I come across the word so that, I put a box around it. Because every time you see so that, it's showing causation. This happens so that this will be true. Okay? You all, you you get the English language. You know how that works. This happens so that this will occur. And God says, I chose him so that he will teach his children and his grandchildren and his house after him. It's not just Abraham that's affected here. God says, I chose him. And sure, he loves Abraham. But he chose him so that he would teach that to future generations also. So that he would teach future generations how to follow the Lord. It's not just Abraham that's at stake here. So he says, I will let him know what I'm going to do for himself and for future generations so that they can see how I work, how I move, what I'm doing. Okay? So... That's how God says he's going to fulfill his promise to bless the nations. He says, I'm going to tell Abraham I've discriminated him. I know him. I've set him apart so that he will teach future generations. So God tells Abraham, goes on, and he tells Abraham of the distress that's coming on Sodom and Gomorrah. And he tells them, um, tells them that the angels are going to go down to the city. They're going to go inspect the city and see what's going on. And then, next thing we know, start of chapter 19... The two angels, or it says men, but we've, we've come to recognize these are angels now. These two men, they show up at Sodom while Abraham is still standing there before the Lord. And Abraham, he begins to plead with God on behalf of the city, right? He starts begging God. He said, would you really sweep away the righteous with the unrighteous? And then you get to verse 25 of chapter 18, and he says, you could not possibly do such a thing. You cannot possibly do such a thing to kill the righteous with the wicked. Treating the righteous and the wicked alike, you could not possibly do that. Won't the judge of the whole earth do what is just? And Abraham here starts to appeal to God's justice. There's our future generations, y'all. Woo! Yes. Yes, she's coming forward. I like it. 
So Abraham here is pleading with God and he appeals to God's justice. He says, would you really destroy the righteous and the unrighteous like there's no distinction? He says, God, you're just. You wouldn't do that. Surely you wouldn't do that. And God, in verse 26, he says, I will spare the whole place for their sake. He says, what if there's 50? I'll spare it for 50. I'll spare the entire city if there are 50 there. And then we get this interesting back and forth between Abraham and God where it's like, well, what if five are missing from that 50? So if there's 45 there, will you still spare? And God's like, okay, fine, I'll still spare the city for 45. What if there's only 40? Okay, I'll spare it for 40. And then 30, and then 20, and then 10. And at 10, God's like, okay, I've reached my threshold, I'm out of here. And he just walks away. It's, he's just gone. So he goes all the way down to 10. And Abraham does something interesting here that I think we all need to learn from. And that's that he combines humility and boldness. Humility and boldness. In the same phrase, he's combining the two. He shows humility because he says, let my Lord not be angry Oh, multiple times, he says, God, please don't be angry with me for approaching you and asking you this. And then, and then he refers to himself as dust and ashes. Abraham is clearly being humble before God. But he also expresses boldness because he keeps on asking and even says, let me be so bold as to ask. Like Abraham is combining humility and boldness as he's praying, as he's pleading with God. And I think this is how we should pray. That's what we need to learn, is that we need to come to God both humbly and boldly. And apparently God had reached his threshold and he leaves at 10. And then, beginning of chapter 19, scene changes. So we flash from Abraham, where we've been focusing, over to Lot. And now we're focused in on Lot in chapter 19 and what's going on down in Sodom. It says that the, angels, the, the men who left Abraham, they arrive at Sodom and they're greeted there by Lot. And it says that Lot is sitting in Sodom's gateway. Why is this significant? Why would it tell us where? Why wouldn't it just say, well, they get to the city and there was Lot? It specifically tells us that it was in the gateway of the city. That's an important note because the gateway of the city was essentially the public square. That's where business was conducted. It's where the elders of the city would gather to see how they should rule the city. And the fact that he was sitting is pretty, pretty important also. The fact that he was sitting in, indicates that he had a position of prominence. It's not like he was standing here. He was sitting there reclining in the, at the gateway. This is an important man. He has a position of prominence. Now, I want to just connect this real quick back to previous experience we've had with Lot because Lot started out with Abraham and then they get these big herds and flocks and they have to separate, right? And where did Lot go? He chose the land towards Sodom. And it says he pitched his tent towards Sodom. He's not in Sodom. But next time we saw Lot, he was in the city. And whenever he was in the city, the city got captured by an enemy. He got taken as a slave. And then it had to be Abraham running them down to rescue him. And he brings him back. But what does Lot do? He went right back to Sodom. Went right back to the city. And now not only, not only is he in the city, but he's a prominent figure in the city. And we just see this progressive nature of sin. Like, okay, at first it's just a distant temptation. And then we're going to get a little closer. And well, now I'm in the sin, but it's not as bad as it could be. And now the sin has completely, just completely enveloped him. Complete control over his life. Just this progressive nature. So, these people get there. Lot's sitting here at the gateway. And at first, Lot does the right thing, right? He, he expresses hospitality towards these visitors. He comes out and he, he acts a lot like Abraham. Actually, at this point, he bows down before him. He offers to wash their feet. He says, come stay at my home and then tomorrow you can go on your way. And at first they refuse his hospitality. They say, no, we'll just stay in the public square. But then Lot begs them and Lot's begging indicates that he knows how evil things are in Sodom. And he says, please come stay with me and begs him and actually talks about urging them with great urgency. Um, so, yeah, it's really emphasizing that Lot knows what's going on. And eventually they agree. And then while they're at the house, there's this interesting confrontation between Lot and the men of Sodom, right? Most of you all know the story. If not, really, please go read it because it's, it's pretty powerful stuff. But there's this confrontation with the men of Sodom at Lot's house. The men of the city, they knew that these men, or what we know are angels, they had the appearance of men, they're in the town. So um, they, it says that they gathered. It actually says that the whole population gathered. And I don't know if that means literally like everybody in the city, every man of the city, or if it's hyperbole, if it's exaggerating this for a dramatic effect, where it's saying that there's a whole bunch. It's like me saying, everybody's in this room. Like, okay, 
we all know that not every single person is in the room. It's just like he's saying, okay, there was a whole bunch of people out there. There's a whole bunch of men. And they're out here saying, send those men out so that we can do unspeakable things to them. And I don't need to elaborate too much because most of y'all get it. Like, they're talking about doing some really, really heinous things. Um, one commentator, actually, just, just quickly, I'll tell you what he said. He said that this was a picture of pervasive homosexuality. Um, and it's not the main point. What we do see, though, is extreme sin here in the city. And they're asking to do unspeakable things to these visitors. And Lot knows, knows that what they're talking about doing is evil. He knows that. He actually calls it evil. He, hollered, he, he yells to his brothers and he begs them not to do this evil thing. He calls it evil. He knows that what they're wanting to do is wrong. So regardless of whether, whether Lot knew it or not, he, or whether Lot accepted it or not, he at least knew in some way that what was happening was wrong. Yet here he is, a leader in this city. Quick side note, he also calls the men of Sodom brothers. So even though he knows that this is wrong, he is so ingrained in this city and so connected to these people that he is saying we are brothers in this. And there's a couple points of irony here. First of all, Lot begs the men not to do evil, and then he offers an evil alternative, right? He says, don't take these men. Here's my daughters instead. So he, off, he says, don't do this evil. I'll give you a different evil to do in its place. You know, a little bit ironic there. And later on, we're going to see that the very evil that he's asking the men of the city not to do is the same evil that his daughters will do back to him. So we see that it's a little ugly because Lot is doing this. But the men refuse to listen to Lot. They want what they want, and they press forward. So the angels intervene at this point. These angels intervene. They reach out. They pull Lot back into the house, and then it says that they strike the men of Sodom with blindness. Strike them with blindness. And I actually love the word that it uses for, uh, for striking them. It's, it's this word that's usually re referenced with a physical beating. So it's almost like, he pound, like these angels are pounding them with blindness, just absolutely pounding them with blindness, and they can't see where they're going. And then, so Lot is commanded by the angels to go and get everybody he knows and he loves out of the city. He knows that the city's about to be destroyed, and Lot apparently had other daughters because he goes to his sons-in-law's houses, and he begs them to get out of the city. He says, please leave the city, and they think he's joking. I don't know about y'all, but if I come telling you to get out of town because something bad's about to happen, I am not joking, okay? I will not play that prank on you, I promise. But Lot apparently has tried this before somehow, I don't know, but they think he's joking, so they don't leave. And then morning comes along, and the angels say, Lot, get out of town. Take the daughters who are here with you and your wife and run. Like, get out. Get away from the sin. Run away. But... Let's, let's give Lot a little bit of grace here. Just, just a little bit of grace, okay? This is everything Lot has worked for, isn't it? This city represents Lot's life work. It, that's everything to him. I mean, this is his home. This is where he's raised his family. This is where his friends lived. It's where he's worked, and he's been striving to improve this city for decades now. I know it's really easy to look at Lot and be like, Lot, you didn't have it all together here, man. Like, figure it out. But let's give him a little bit of grace because this is a place that he has worked to improve. So he hesitates. He hesitates. And he thinks, wait, do I really have to run? Is it going to be as bad as you're saying it's going to be? I, I, I think we'll be okay. Just, just, let's just wait a minute. Let's, let's rethink this. But then we get to verse 16 of chapter 19. And it says, because of the Lord's compassion for him. Because of the Lord's compassion for him. The men, the angels... They grabbed his hand, his wife's hand, and the hands of his two daughters, and they basically dragged them out of the city. And the reason for that is the most important part of that whole sentence, because of the Lord's compassion. This is the key to this whole passage, to this whole, whole chapter. It's that he was compassionate. God, had he wanted to, could have very well come down and destroyed everything, right? He could have just rained it down and swept a lot away like that, like it was nothing. He has the power to do that. But because he was compassionate, he spared Lot and his family. Because of his compassion, he worked to get Lot out of there. Um, 
I've, I've heard people say, would a, would a just God, would a righteous God, a loving God, would a loving God really send people to hell? Well, would a just God really save anybody? Because if we really think about it, the Bible says that we are all sinners. We're all sinners. And we know from the Bible, the Bible tells us that if you sin, that means that you deserve death. And not just physical death, but eternal death. That's what we deserve if we're sinners. And the Bible says all have sinned, which means that every single one of us ultimately deserves eternal damnation, which is a really hard pill to swallow. But because of God's justice, there has to be a, the penalty has to be paid for sin. It has to be paid because God is perfectly just. So a just God means that none of us should naturally be forgiven. Here's the thing. What people are saying whenever they say, would a loving God send somebody to hell? They are overlooking who God is. God is loving, absolutely. But because of his great compassion, some of us are not going to go to hell. Some of us will get to spend eternity with him. That is God's incredible compassion. It is compassion and compassion. He gives us an option, an escape goat. He gives us a way out. He's determined here to spare Lot and his family. Why? Because he somehow has to? No, because his great compassion. Man, if you are saved by God, just be so thankful that he's compassionate. I hope you see how loving and how kind and how merciful and how compassionate God is for saving even one. So thank God for that. So it's at this point they get out of the city. They plead with the angels regarding their final destination. And they run. They finally settle on this place called Zoar. Um, and just so you know, Zoar actually means small or insignificant. So they're saying, let us go to this small and insignificant place on the plain. Don't send us to the mountain. Let us go to this small and insignificant place. It's, it's meaningless. Please just let us go to this place. And finally they agree, and that's where they go. But they get there, and then there's this interesting thing that happens with Lot's wife, right? It says she looks back and what happens to her. She's turned into a pillar of salt. Turned to a pillar of salt. And I have no idea what that means. Ha! Huh. I have no clue what that means. I don't know what a pillar of salt is. I've, I've read some, some theories on what that is. Some people think it was like a stone statue almost, like she's going along, and now all of a sudden she's like this stone statue, this, this just completely immobile that would eventually deteriorate to nothing. Okay, maybe that's what's going on. I have no idea. What we know is it's not good. You can tell from context, it's not a good thing. So she's, she's punished for looking back. But, but let's just think about this for a minute. This is not just like a curious glance backwards. It's like, let's get out of Sodom, let's run away, let's get out of here, and they're running. And I, what I always used to picture is she's running along, and it's like, well, I hear something exploding behind me, and it's like, okay, I'm going to turn and glance, and then she's just frozen like this. Nobody move. Okay, no, I'm kidding. Okay, so going along like that and just, just frozen. That's what I've always pictured. But I, that's not what the text indicates here. The Hebrew word here for glancing back, looking back, is the Hebrew word nabat. Um, and it means actually like a longing or a yearning. Like she's yearning to go back to Sodom. She's just gotten out of the fire and brimstone, y'all. She's been, she has escaped from this burning sulfur that's going to come down. And she's like, oh, man, I really wish I could go back to Sodom. Hmm, man, it was nice. I had a cushy life. I could recline at the gateway of the city. Everything was nice. I had a powerful husband. Everything was smooth. And she was longing for Sodom. She wanted to go back. Wanted to go back. Her heart was not with the Lord. Her heart was in Sodom. That was the problem. Let's just make that clear. It's not like God had a rash reaction whenever she glanced over her shoulder. Oh no, she wanted to be back in Sodom. And for that reason, her fate was kind of like that of those people in Sodom. Because that's where her heart was. And I hope that we can see the distinction there. But then we get this quick flashback. At this point, we get this quick flashback back to Abraham to see what's going on with him. And it says about verses 20, verse 28 of chapter 19, it says that he's looking out where he had been standing before the Lord, um, looks out over the plain, sees the smoke rising from the plain. Um, it says it's like a smoke from a furnace. And then in verse 29, here's what it says. 
It says, when God destroyed the cities of the plain, he remembered Abraham and brought Lot out of the middle of the upheaval when he demolished the cities where Lot lived. This kind of indicates that Lot was saved for Abraham's sake. Because he remembered Abraham, he saved Lot. Because of Abraham's intercession, God saved Lot. He rescued Lot. Abraham's intercession really made a difference. And then finally, the chapter ends with this weird section about Lot and his daughters. Um, and naturally, they want sons. Because in this time and place, that was everything, right? That was, having an heir was everything to these people. So, they're here. They want sons. The only man around is their father, though. So, they devise a scheme and they take advantage of their father. But let's just make it clear, Lot is not innocent in this either. Lot, he was willing to overindulge himself with, with alcohol to the extent that he was blackout drunk and he didn't even remember what had happened the night before. And not only does he do this once, he does this on back-to-back -back nights. Let's just make it clear, Lot is not innocent in all of this. Lot clearly has his faults. And then the chapter ends with the birth of Lot's sons slash grandsons, which is a really weird thing to say, um, but that's what happens. So they're born, and the first one is named Moab. And just so you know who the Moabites were, who these people were, they wind up being hostile neighbors of Israel and cause all kinds of problems. The other son they named ben -Ami, which is the father of the Ammonite people. Who, and these people were wandering herdsmen. If you keep reading through the Bible, you're going to find that the Ammonites, they continually ally them, ally themselves with the people around Israel, and they cause real problems for Israel also. So these two sons that are born from this incestual relationship, they cause all kinds of problems down the road. All kinds of problems. Sin has lasting effects. Lasting effects. Okay? So let's just make that as clear as we can. So that's that's end of chapter 18. That's chapter 19. Um, what do we do with this whole thing? Okay? I told you I got three lessons that I want us to work through. But before we do that, before we do that, because it's daylight savings time and we've already been talking for a long time, I want everybody to stand up for just a minute. Everybody stand up for just a minute because I don't want you to fall asleep on me. Okay? Everybody stretch out because I got another hour and a half to go. Ha <laughs> ha! You all think I'm joking. Okay. Stretch out, kick your legs, hit your neighbor, whatever you want to do. Um, get, that was really hostile. Really hostile. Okay. All right. We're good. Everybody good? Everybody awake? Halfway? Got a little blood flow in your legs? Okay. Three lessons. Three lessons from this really difficult part of Scripture. I know that this is a heavy story, and if I'm being honest with you, some of my application might be a little heavy also, but stay with me because we learned three lessons that we can apply to our lives here. Okay, first of all, you cannot possibly overestimate the significance of godly intercession. You cannot overestimate the value of godly intercession. I actually remember hearing a preacher say once that when God's people intercede, God intervenes. So godly intercession leads to godly or, or God's intervention. Okay? So here's the way I want to say this. When we as God's people start praying, God starts moving. Like, Pray, pray. God, God was going to absolutely destroy this place and everybody in it. He was going to eliminate the whole place. But what happened? Abraham prayed and prayed and pleaded with God. But remember how he did it. Remember how he did it. He came humbly, first of all, recognizing his position before God. And I think sometimes, sometimes we miss this. Because, okay, our, our, our American Christianity, we really want to emphasize, like, God is our friend or God is our close father. Like, we, we want to emphasize those things. And those are true. Okay, those are true. We, but we want to emphasize those to the point where we're almost irreverent. Like, we almost bring God down to our level somehow. Like, okay, we are almost equal. He's got a little more power than I do to make some things happen. But, you know, we're close. No, 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 you're not. Let's make this as clear as we can. You are nowhere near God's level. Okay? Not even close. Like, just, I can't, I don't know how to make that more clear. You are not anywhere near God. Okay? I think that's clear. I think what I'm trying to say is clear. Does that make sense, y'all? Everybody with me? I'm tired too, okay? So there, take that. All right. So remember that God wants humility. We should be humble before God. Um, but this is the God of the universe we're talking about. 
Yes, he's our father. Yes, he's our friend. Yes, he's near to us. But at the same time, this is the God of the universe who spoke all things into existence. The one that with the sound of his voice, the universe happened. Like nothing happens outside of God's say so. He has ultimate and incredible authority. And to him, we are but dust and ashes. Before him, we are nothing more than dust and ashes. Remember, that's how man was formed. He was formed out of the dust. And then it wasn't anything but the breath of God that made man come to life. This is the God of the universe. And we had better come to him with a little bit of humility. A little bit of humility. So Abraham, we saw that he was humble. But not only was he humble, he was also bold. So we should absolutely recognize our standing before God as dust and ashes, but we still go boldly to approach his throne of grace. Why? Because Jesus made a way for that. Jesus made a way for us to approach God. That's pretty awesome. Um, a couple of the verses, I just want to show you this just to kind of drive this point home. One of them I know I've quoted several times recently, but I'm going to keep doing it because it's so good. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 16. It says, therefore, because Jesus came and we can relate to him, Therefore, let us approach the throne of grace with boldness so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in a time of need. Yeah, you can approach the throne of grace. Second verse I want to show you here is 1 John chapter 5. It's actually two verses, 14 and 15. It says, this is the confidence we have before him. If we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears whatever we ask, we know that what we that we have what we have asked of him. In other words, if you ask God for something in his will, like in the spirit, like just seeking his heart, if you come to God looking for God's will to be done, whatever you ask is going to happen because it's God's will. Okay? So let's make that abundantly clear. There is power in prayer, and we should come to God boldly while coming to him humbly. So we pray humbly and boldly, but notice what Abraham does. Notice again what Abraham does. He appeals to God's character. He appeals to God's character, who God is, to God's perfect justice. And when we pray, I think we would do well if we remembered that prayer is really more about who God is than what we want. That's what prayer is about. It's about who God is, not just what we want. Okay, Abraham certainly cared for people. Of course he cared for the people down in the plain. He cared for those people. Those are human beings. And he especially cared for Lot, so he's begging for God. But he doesn't say that Lot was a good man or he deserved anything from God. He doesn't come and say, God, here's what I want, and I think that you should change what you want to meet what I want. Instead, he says, God, you are just. You are a perfect judge. You are perfect. So, God, would you really wipe the righteous away with the unrighteous? He appeals to who God is. He comes to God saying, God, just remember who you are. Huh. That's different from how most of us pray, myself included. He comes and says, God, be God. And he appeals to God's justice and pleads with him to spare the city on account of the few righteous. So does that describe you? Does that describe the way that you pray? Are you pleading with God on behalf of others? I actually, um, one of my favorite lines, and I know I've probably said this too, I know that Mike and I have talked about this before, but I've heard it said that many, many midweek prayer meetings at churches are more about keeping Christians out of heaven than they are about keeping sinners out of hell. Like, what are we, what's, what's our heart really want? Does our heart really want comfort? Or does our heart really want for people to be saved? Like, what are we really longing for? I'm not saying it's wrong to pray for healing of somebody, but what is, what is our real emphasis? What is our drive? What drives, what fuels our prayers? Is it that I want people to know Jesus, to experience his grace in their lives? Or is it, oh, I want people to not struggle? What's, what drives us? What really drives us? What is our priority? So the first thing we learn here is that you cannot overestimate the significance of godly intercession. So I want to urge you, please pray for the lost. Pray for the lost. Second lesson we learn here is that God will protect those who belong to him. God will protect those who belong to him. And let me explain, because nothing, nothing about today's text, nothing about today's text indicates that Lot was a good guy. Nothing about it indicates that. Not a thing. However, what we do find, whenever you come to the New Testament, is that Lot was apparently a man who knew the Lord. 
apparently, because you get to 2 Peter chapter 2, and this is a long section, but I want to read it because it really teaches us a lot about who Lot was. A lot about who Lot was. I didn't mean to do that. That was fun. So 2 Peter chapter 2, verses 6 through 9, it says, And if he reduced, if God reduced the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah to ashes and condemned them to extinction, making them an example of what is coming to the ungodly, and if he rescued righteous Lot, distressed by the depraved behavior of the immoral, for as that righteous man lived among them day by day, his righteous soul was tormented by the lawless deeds he saw and heard. Then the Lord knows how to rescue the godly from trials and to keep the unrighteous under punishment for the day of judgment. What Peter just did was explain that Lot was a godly man. He loved the Lord. He was distressed by the evil of Sodom. He calls him righteous Lot. Like From today's text, that's not something I would have picked up on. But clearly, Peter here, being inspired by the Holy Spirit, knows something about Lot. Now, does that mean, does that mean, okay, because I said God will protect those who belong to him. Does that mean that you're never going to experience a trial? Absolutely not. And I hope if you've been here for any amount of time, you know that I'm not going to tell you that. Because that's just a lie. That does not mean you're never going to experience trouble in this life. Um, instead, what it means is that absolutely nothing, nothing can separate you from the love of God that is in Jesus. Nothing can. And I can say that because that's in the Bible. I'm confident in that. There is nothing that can separate you from the love of God. It means that even death itself cannot separate you from the love that is in Jesus. So whatever that thing is, that struggle, that obstacle in front of you, it can't ultimately destroy you. It doesn't have that authority. It doesn't have that authority. Why? Well, because Jesus is bigger than anything. And I want to be careful because I, I actually kind of like this. It kind of makes me feel good if I'm being completely honest. I've been, called, I've been told I'm not a feel-good preacher, and somebody's going to laugh in just a minute. Um, but I've been told I'm not a feel-good preacher, okay? And I actually kind of appreciate that a little bit because I know that the Bible doesn't always make me feel those warm, fuzzy feelings inside. Sometimes it hurts. That's just true because I'm a sinful person, and the Bible naturally conflicts with your sin. Okay, so I, I'm fine with being told I'm not a feel-good preacher. I actually kind of appreciate that a little bit. So I want to be careful at this point, telling you that you can overcome anything. You can overcome absolutely anything. I want to be careful at this point, because I don't mean that you're always going to get it right, or that you'll always get the bonus or the promotion, or that you'll win your battle with cancer, or that you're going to win a battle over depression or anxiety. I don't mean that you're going to win your battle over whatever it is that you're facing, or that there's never going to be hard times come on your family, because... I don't have the authority to say that. What I can say with absolute certainty is that if Jesus is the Lord of your life, those things cannot take you from the grace of Jesus. They cannot take you from the love of God. They don't have that authority. Okay? And the beauty of this life is that we know the end of the story. Y'all, we got the book. We know how the story ends. Right? We know how it ends. And it ends with Jesus punching death in the face. We learn here that righteous Lot, his wife, his two daughters that are still living under his roof, that they are saved by God's grace because of his great compassion. And in the end, that's how you can be saved too, by God's grace, through God's compassion. And you can be saved in the end. And I promise you, God will not lose. So, first of all, you cannot overestimate the significance of godly intercession. Second, God will protect those who belong to him. And third, and this is maybe the most important, and if I'm being honest, I was incredibly convicted with this last point this week, and I really wrestled with this so much so that Friday, as I'm trying to write this, I had to stop, I had to put the computer away, and I had to call my wife and say, "Hun, um, this is really eating at me a little bit. Okay, so now that you're all scared, I'll tell you what this is, all right? And it's pretty simple but it's incredibly important, and that is beware of Sodom. Please, beware of Sodom. I actually stole this language from a professor at Southwestern Seminary in Fort Worth um, named Darren Biles. Sorry, Darren Biles. <clears throat> and what he's getting at is to beware of the sinfulness of Sodom. Beware of the sinfulness of Sodom. Please, make absolutely no mistake. I cannot tell you this with enough emphasis God will judge sin. He will. God is a perfect judge. And from the first couple pages of the Bible, whenever we see Adam's sin to the very last par few paragraphs of the Bible in Revelation 22, we see that God judges sin. God judges sin. It has to happen because our God is perfectly just. Perfectly just. 
So God does judge sin. That is a universal fact. God hates sin. That's why there are so many warnings to flee from sin. That's why there are so many places in the Bible that says to repent and to sin no more. It's why there are warning after warning after warning against the lust of the world because a holy God can and must judge sin. Must judge sin. But we're going to take this a step further, maybe two steps further. We'll see how far we get because I'm going to run out of time. And you all are going to fall asleep. So, one step further. I said in the beginning of this that this was kind of a story of two men, right? The tale of two men, even though I don't know what tale of two cities is about. They're standing at this fork in the road. We see one goes one way, the other goes the other way. One takes the well-trodden path. The other one takes the one less traveled. You see this distinction between Abraham and Lot. And if you remember, chapter 18, verse 19, it said, For I have chosen him, I've chosen Abraham, so that he will command his children and his house after him to keep the way of the Lord by doing what is right and just. God would eventually make his glory known through Abraham's family. And that the way he raised his children was important. The way he brought up the next generation was incredibly important. Teaching them right from wrong was exceptionally important because this was the family through whom God was going to bless the whole world. But what about Lot? Was it important for him? Of course it was. Of course it was. Lot was raising his children. He had, he had the responsibility of training up his children. But he was bringing them up in a sinful and a worldly place where it was all about pleasure and to steal a line from judges, essentially they did whatever was right in their own eyes. They rebelled against God, and that impacted not only Lot and his wife, who was turned into a pillar of salt, but also his children. And I'm not suggesting at this point that Abraham had it all figured out, because clearly he didn't. And we're going to see that over the next couple weeks. Abraham didn't have it all figured out, but... But he was intentional about not exposing his wife and his children to the filth in the plain. He was very deliberate about that. Perhaps, perhaps this is speculation. Maybe Lot thought, you know what, I'm strong enough. I know that there's sinfulness going on here, but I'm not going to fall into that trap. I'm, I'm okay. I can resist that temptation. I can resist what's going on down there. It's okay. I can have it around me, but I'll be different. I won't be drug into this, or I won't be drug into that. And maybe that was true to a degree. Maybe it was. But what about what his children saw and what they heard? What about what was influencing them and impacting their lives? What was leaving an impression on their hearts? Um, and I told you I want to exercise just a little bit of discretion here because I don't want to impose my convictions on you all. That wouldn't be fair. Um, but I do want to make absolutely clear what the Bible is getting at here. I want to make it as clear as I possibly can. Um, clearly, Abraham and Lot both have responsibility to teach the next generation how to live. And what Lot says, at least through his action... That the most, he says that the most important thing is what the city has to offer. While Abraham makes the most important thing serving the Lord. And the differences are stark. Like, just read the chapter and you see the difference. Like, you can see the difference. So I want to urge parents, because know this, please know this. As far as God is concerned... It is not the school's job to train your children. It is not the government's job to train your children. It's your job. As far as God is concerned, you are responsible for training up your kids. You are. Nobody else. You are responsible for your children. It is a responsibility that God has given to you. So please, I am urging you, do not be lot pretending to be doing the right thing just because your children might look successful or you look successful. Because Lot certainly looks successful here. He looked like he had it all together. He's an important man in this city in the plain, sitting back, relaxing at the gateway of the city. But clearly, clearly he had some issues going on. And his children were being impacted by the world just like he was. So listen, success doesn't mean, doesn't mean that you are a successful parent. Because your job isn't to make kids that are comfortable. It's not your job to make kids even that are successful. Your job as parents and grandparents, your job is to raise them up in the way they should go. That's your job. That's what we're to do, is to teach our kids how to know right from wrong, to follow the Lord. That is our task. If I had to choose between my kids being comfortable 
or my kids being holy. I want my kids to be holy. Um, if I had to choose between my kids being successful and, or living for Jesus, I want my kids to live for Jesus every time. And I know what that means. I know that that might make me uncomfortable at times. But that's what I think we should want and desire. And instead of saying, you know what, somebody else will teach them how to be good people, that's not their job, it's yours. And I don't know that I can overemphasize this because Sodom here, Sodom here had an impact on Lot and his family. And we see the devastating repercussions of that. And it's no different today. Um, I was... I was really convicted about this whenever I was sitting at my desk and I wasn't even, I wasn't even reading this. I'd been studying this and I read an article from a school district that's not all that far from here that was talking about in, introducing um, certain curriculum that was sexually explicit at, as early as first grade. First grade. And I couldn't, like, I don't get it. I just don't understand. But then I started thinking, why would I expect the world not to do worldly things? Like, okay, that was brilliant. Y'all, again, I don't want to impose my convictions on you, but know this, you are responsible for raising your children in the way they should go. It's your responsibility. I want to urge you, please, beware of Sodom. Okay, its influence is often subtle, but it's every bit as dangerous. And I know I'm running up against time, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do my best to tie a bow on this because the reality is, is that Jesus came and offered God's compassion. Offered God's compassion. He offered that fork in the road. So you may have been motoring down this road right towards Sodom. You may have been motoring down this, wor- this road, but Jesus says, I came to give you a fork in the road so you don't have to go that way. I offer you something better. And the path, it might be a little rougher and it might be a little harder to go down. But I assure you, at the end of the line, when you get to your destination, you will be so thankful that you took the road less traveled. So I want to urge you with that. Let's pray together. Father, I thank you again for this time. Um, God, I, I want to pray for the next generation or for my kids, for our other kids that are here today, or for our children that are in children's church right now. God, I I want, to, I want to ask for your grace and your compassion on them. Father, I, I know I pray this for my kids often, but Lord, I pray that you would call them to yourself, that you would convince them of their sin, and that you would urge them to repent and to turn to you. Father, I pray for the salvation of my daughter and my sons. Lord, I pray for the salvation of all of these kids here. God, I pray that all of them would say, I want to serve the Lord. And God, I pray that you would help their parents and their grandparents to be people who say, I want to raise my children in the way they should go. I want to teach them what it means to be a follower of Jesus. I want to teach them what it means to know right from wrong. I want to teach them what it means to be a servant of God. Lord, I pray that that would be on our tongues. I pray that that would be in our houses. I pray that to, to steal a word from, a line from your scripture, God, I pray that it would be written on the doorpost of our homes. God, I pray that they, it would just be everywhere, God, and that our kids would come to know you as their, as their saviors. Lord, because you are Lord, whether we acknowledge you as such or not. So, Father, I pray that we would know that before it's too late. Lord, I pray for any single person, anybody who's here today, who does not know you as their Savior. Lord, I pray that you would stand before them and put the fork in the road today, God. And I pray that you would urge them to take the road less traveled, the one that leads to eternal eternal life. And that is belief, that is faith in Jesus. God, I pray that many people would come to know you as their Savior right here in Mound City and the surrounding area. God, I pray for your grace and your kindness and your mercy to be known. Lord, I thank you for this time. I thank you for the challenge that this word is. God, and I pray that you would make it effective because I know I can't. So I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.